You are here Moving in our midst We worship you We worship you You are here Working in this place We worship worship you you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my God that is who you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my God that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship worship you. You are here, bending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that
Good morning, Renew. This is our call to worship. A call to worship sets the tone as we begin our time of worship together. I will read um, a series of calls and in turn you will read with canon the response marked with the text all. Here today there is love, freely available to all, not our human loving, fragile and intermittent, but God's supreme love. May a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth break forth into joyous songs of praise. Here today is love, higher than our loftiest hopes, deeper than the immensities of time and space, God's inclusive love. Let the seas roar their praise and everything in them. Let the rivers clap their hands and the hills sing together their happiness. The joy of the living Christ Jesus be with you all and also with you.
morning, I'm Pastor Dave Sim of Renew Church here in Linwood, and welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. So glad you could join us. If this is your first time and you want to know more about us, go head over to our website at renewlinwood.church, renewlinwood.church. And while you're there, uh, feel free to fill out our connection card, a digital connection card, so we can get a hold of you and uh, you can leave some prayer requests as well, and I'll be praying for you this week. Um, every week or most every Sunday, we start off with family time. And during family time, we play a game just to uh, break the ice and warm up with one another and leaving our responses in the Facebook comments. So today, because May is Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, uh, we're gonna have some Asian American Pacific Islander um, trivia. So the first question is, what year did Hawaii become a state? A, 1933, B, 1959, C, 1961, or D, 1975? 30 seconds. And the answer is B, Hawaii became a state in 1959. On to our next question. Gary Locke was the first Asian American governor of a mainland state. What state was he from? A, California, B, Montana, C, Colorado, D, Washington. The answer is D. Gary Locke of Washington was the first Asian American governor of a mainland state. I think that was a little easy because we're all here in Washington. Next question. In the 18th century, which Asian, which Asian Pacific Islander group was the first to settle in the U.S.? Which Asian Pacific Islander group was the first to settle in the U.S. A. Chinese B. Samoans C. Filipinos D. Hawaiians 30 seconds And the answer is C, Filipinos in Louisiana were the first recorded settlement of Asians in the United States. That's it for our trivia today. On to musical worship. There's none like you And no one else can touch my heart like you do And I could search for all eternity long 
and find there is none like you. There's none like you No one else can touch my heart like you do And I search for all eternity long And find there is none like you Your mercy flows like a river and healing comes from your hands and Suffering children are safe in your arms There is none like you There is none like you touch my heart like you do and I search for all eternity long and find there is none like you there is none like you and no one else can touch my heart like you do I can search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. And I can search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. During greeting time, we take to the Facebook comments and say hi to one another, greet one another, uh, say who you are, who you're worshiping with, where you're worshiping from. And uh, we have an icebreaker question. And today's icebreaker question, which you can uh, answer in the comments is, is What is the best book you've ever read? What is the best book you've ever read and you can't say the Bible? Come on. So, ready, break.
A Psalm Sing to the Lord a new song, because he has done wonderful things. His own strong hand and his own holy arm have won the victory. The Lord has made his salvation widely known. He has revealed his righteousness in the eyes of all the nations. God has remembered his loyal love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. Every corner of the earth has seen our God's salvation. Shout triumphantly to the Lord, all the earth. Be happy, rejoice out loud, sing your praises. Sing your praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of music, with trumpets and a horn blast. Shout triumphantly before the Lord, the king let the sea and everything in it roar the world and all its inhabitants too let all the rivers clap their hands let the mountains rejoice out loud all together before the lord because he is coming to establish justice on the earth he will establish justice in the world rightly he will establish justice among all people fairly.
Now revealed in you are Christ What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ our King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this Today's scripture reading is from Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 38. 
Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again and they accompanied him to the ship. Thank you for reading the scripture passage. And again, that was Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 38 in the Common English Bible Version. And we continue in our Acts series, The Spirit-Infused Multi-Ethnic Church. And I've entitled my sermon today, Parting Words, Parting Words. But previously on Acts, we remember in Ephesus, the confrontation of the power of the Holy Spirit versus the powers of the city, the sorcerers, the false prophets, priests, and an overall culture that worshiped Artemis and the occult. A stronghold is broken and many in Ephesus turn from their past and turn to the way of Jesus Christ. And it's here that Paul gives us his end game. In verse uh, thir 21 of chapter 19, once these things had come to pass, had come to an end, Paul, guided by the Spirit, decided to return to Jerusalem, taking a route that would carry him through the provinces of Macedonia and Achaia. He said, after I've been there, I must ro visit Rome as well. But at the close of Acts 19, this spiritual and social battle still rages on as Demetrius, a silversmith who made idols of Artemis' temple, leads a riot um, of the craftspeople. The honest reason is that the way and what Paul is preaching and teaching is an economic threat uh, to the idol makers as um, the gospel confronted what was made by the hands of human beings um, are not true gods. Again, we see that the root of many oppressive systems is economics or money. Um, so these men led by Demetrius, these craftspeople, they riot rushing into the great theater in Ephesus, chanting, USA, you, oh, just kidding. 
Great is Artemis of, Ephes of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. For two hours straight before the city manager de-escalates the situation with reason and sends the people home. From here, Paul moves on from Ephesus, which brings us to chapter 20. Generally, uh, Paul's travels and his ministry is divided into three missionary journeys. Each successive journey retraces Paul's step to the churches in his previous journey, where Paul strengthens the church he's established, the churches he's established. And then the journey also expands to, a new, to new places. The first journey, remember, began in Antioch and moved between places in Asia Minor. The second journey begins out of Antioch, retraces to the churches in Asia Minor, and then expands to Europe and Greece, all the way to Ephesus um, in Ionian Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, then returns to Jerusalem and finally ends in Antioch. And then the third missionary journey also begins uh, in Antioch, retraces all of Paul's prior stopping points. Again, he's strengthening the disciples along the way and then ends in Jerusalem. So the question is, if the pattern is retracing and encouraging the churches he's already established and then expanding into new places in his next missionary journey, what is the expansion of his journey after his third missionary trip? This would be Rome as we read in chapter 19. If you remember, I mentioned that in 1921, Paul declares his endgame. I must go to Jerusalem and then to Rome. And if we were to summarize the book of Acts as a whole, right? The book of Acts begins in Jerusalem, the center of religious power. And then it ends in Rome, the center of world military power. The entire thrust of Acts then can be described, summarized by this, the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome, thereby fulfilling Jesus' original command from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And while Paul is retracing his steps, he's also taking up a collection from these mission churches to take back to the church in Jerusalem, which was struggling through famine and poverty. Remember in Acts 13, before Paul's first journey, Paul takes a collection um, from this new Gentile church in Antioch back to the church in Jerusalem. This collection continues in Asia Minor and Europe. Another connection that we should make as readers is that I believe... Um, I believe that we're meant to make is that just as Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem in his last days, as the gospel writer writes, and then dies by a Roman judicial system, by the Roman judicial system, Paul is now setting his face towards Jerusalem and then ultimately to Rome, anticipating that he will face much suffering and injustices and harm and torture. And I believe we are to recognize Paul, um, not that Paul is Jesus himself, right? But as an archetype of the Messiah, whose message and journey lead increasingly to danger as a threat to the established religious power and the established world military cultural power. Good times, good times, right? Um, so in Acts 20, in the beginning of Acts 20, we learn that or Paul makes his way to Troas. His other disciples have gone before him. And in Troas, um, he starts to preach and he starts in the middle of the evening. And three hours later, he's still preaching. He's still preaching. Um, and maybe some of us can resonate with this, but one of Eutychus, one of the young boys, is sitting on the windowsill as Paul is talking, and he falls asleep. So, Because who wouldn't fall asleep after three or so hours of a sermon? 
and he's on the windowsill, he falls asleep, and he falls down and dies. Uh, so, I like to call this section, Death by Sermon. But uh, maybe you guys are experiencing that right now. But <laughs> anyways, Paul raises this boy back from the dead, back to life. The resurrection miracle. Um, after this, and the people are uh, in, in awe and amazed. Um, after this, Paul rendezvous um, with the leaders of Ephesus, um, which leads up into our section. Uh, he rendezvous uh, with the leaders in Ephesus because he's in a hurry. He's in a rush to get to Jerusalem. So he doesn't want to uh, circle back to Ephesus. So he tells uh, the, the leaders of Ephesus, come and meet me in Miletus, right? Uh, and so he meets them there where he gives them his parting words, which is our passage today. And one of the things I want to point out in this, that throughout Paul's speech, throughout his words to the leaders of Ephesus, and remember, Paul spent three years in Ephesus. It's a church that he really invested in, uh, invested a lot of his time raising up leaders and uh, building up the church. And so this is uh, a transition. This is a moment as he's saying his last words. And we'll see at the end of this passage that there's a lot of emotion as Paul says his farewells. But one of the things to note in, this, in his speech or parting words is that Paul addresses the elders of Ephesus in three, with three, in three different ways. So first, uh, they're called elders, right? And at the word elders itself comes from the Greek word presbyterius, right? Which we get the, our word presbyterian, right? Led by elders, led by a group of leaders. And then the second word that he uses to address these leaders is overseers. Um, actually, the actual word in our passage, let's see, let's see, supervisors, um, but over, also overseers. And that word comes from um, what the Greek word, from where we get the English word, episcopal, right? Which means led by the bishop, episcopal, led by the bishop. Presbyterius, episcopal, and then finally, he addresses the people, the leaders, as shepherds, as shepherds who are taking care of the sheep entrusted to them. Paul's mission, which is worth his own life, he says, this is worth me giving my life, is to continue to carry the message further on. We see in this, in this statement, in this, in this uh, farewell speech, how much passion, how much conviction that Paul has, right? He must carry the gospel message. I am called to preach and teach the gospel, and I must carry the message further on, ultimately, all the way to Rome, right? The heart of the beast. He doesn't stay. He could stay in Ephesus in this great growing church forever with people that he loves, his family, brothers and sisters in Christ. But he doesn't stay. He has to move on and he's driven by this mission which is worth his own life. And I think this raises the question for me, right? Has the church today, the American church, lost its, its apostolic edge? Have we emphasized staying and building up the single community with church growth and community as the end game, or rather security, and, and then on the flip side, de-emphasize the sending out of apostles, sending apostles out to plant churches and witness on the outskirts? Right? Perhaps a more positive way to read uh, this or say this is that to some, God has given the call to be apostles. And Paul recognizes this, recognizes this as his call. 
apostles, apostoleo, means sent, right? To be sent. And so an apostle is one who is sent. And Paul recognizes this as his call. But then turns to the leaders in Ephesians in Ephesus and calls them elders, overseers, and pastors of the church. Right? I must go. I am sent. I must move on. But let me bless you. Let me empower you. Let me charge you to be elders, overseers, and shepherds of the church in Ephesus. You are called to stay and build up the community of faith. I believe a healthy community holds the both end of these two things. We send those out who we recognize as apostles and evangelists. We send them out and then we appoint leaders to shepherd the flock at home. It's not just leave the evangelism to the evangelists, right? It's also as a whole community, all of us must ensure that as a church, we are reaching out missionally. We are reaching out in our neighborhoods. We are reaching out and serving. And also, we are also building up the community internally. We're discipling people. We're raising, we're pointing people towards spiritual formation and growth in their faith in God, in Jesus Christ. Both of those things, the whole church, a healthy church, mustn't lean towards one way or lean towards the other way but hold these two things both and we must both reach out and be sent and we must build up and grow in faith and discipleship a healthy church will value and recognize both of these very important streams the other thing I see as Paul says, stay alert. It's like going back to the uh, Eutychus in, in Troas who fell asleep and fell out of the third story window. It's like sometimes as a pastor and I see someone nodding in the front, I'm not offended by that, but I like to play a game and be like, start yelling. You know, and sometimes I can yell in my preaching and I'll say, stay alert. Right? And be like, wake up. Right? Stay alert. Paul's final words are stay alert. Wake up. Be engaged. Look at the world around you. That's what, what I see. Like To stay alert is to be aware of the people around you. What's going on around you. Don't just be in a lull, right? In our safe space as a community here in Ephesus. Worshiping God and praying with each other. But stay alert, Paul says. Stay alert. Remember that for three years, I constantly and tearfully warned each one of you. I never start, stopped warning you. Now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all whom God has made holy. I haven't craved anyone's silver, gold, or clothing. You yourself know that I have provided for my own needs and for those of my companions with my own hands. In everything I have shown you that by working hard, we must help the weak. In this way, we remember the Lord Jesus' words. It is more blessed to give than to receive. You know, all of you know what food coma is right and a lot of times i just take a break in the afternoon because post lunch if i've had a big lunch with lots of carbohydrates i am right i am useless i get so drowsy it's better to just not try to work and just take a nap because i have food coma and get so groggy right and i I, when I hear Paul saying to the leaders in Ephesus, stay alert, I hear him saying, don't get fat, don't get food coma, don't just sit and like 
sit in one place and feed yourself and then get drowsy. But have a sense of urgency. Because remember, that was me for three years. I warned you with passion, with tears in my eyes. I told you about God and the message of God's grace to build you up that you are God's people and you have an inheritance. You are his children. You have an inheritance. And God has made all of you holy. I encourage you. I lift you up. I taught you about the grace of God. You too, you shepherds, you elders, you overseers of the church that I am leaving in your hands, I'm entrusting to you as I go. These are my final words to you. It's in your hands to be alert and be so passionate and so called to, in the same way, turn to the people in your care, the sheep, and love them and encourage them. I, in the message of God's grace and their identity as God's children, made holy by God, continue in my work. Be alert. And I think, what does that work look like? What does that work, what does that mean? And I think Paul gives us a really specific hint at what the Christian community should be all about. In everything, verse 35, I am showing you that by working hard, we must help the weak. By working hard, we must help the weak. And this way, remember the Lord Jesus' words. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul is saying we need, as a church community, well, as the, as the way, people of the way, as a community of faith, you need to embody Jesus' words. It is better to give than to receive. Embody Jesus' words. It is better to give than to receive. Church, we have this same call, right? To work hard to provide for the weak. To work hard to recognize those who do not have voice in our communities, in our neighborhoods. To work hard to serve those um, who are marginalized, who are poor, who do not have access to things because of various reasons. We are to be alert, to open our eyes to the weak around us, the weak even among us, right? We're not just looking down at people, oh, let me help you. But it's, you know, be alert to being people who serve and give. Embody Jesus' words, it is better to give than to receive. Stay alert, help the weak. It's better to give than to receive. It's better to give, be servants. That's what the church is here for in this city, in this country, in this world, is to embody the love of Jesus Christ, the grace of God, and the ways that we love our neighbors, love the poor, love the marginalized, serve those um, who are in need. That is the church, church's mission. Like I said last week, the gospel is not just words or, right? I am a preacher of the gospel. That means I teach the Bible, right? I teach about Jesus Christ. No, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. It's the real power of God moving and transforming lives and bringing good news into situations, right? So we need to be a part of God's good news, right? Being made tangible, 
right? Coming into fruition in people's lives. Another way to look at this is we need to be poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Have poverty of spirit. And we see this poverty in spirit demonstrated in that passion with which they say goodbye to Paul. Right? It says, you know, Paul is leaving. And they've been with him for three years. After he said this, these things, verse 36, he knelt down, right? With all of them to pray. How many times do we kneel down in the church? How many times do we kneel down? Are we poor in spirit? He knelt down with all of them to pray. And they cried uncontrollably as everyone embraced and kissed Paul, right? Weeping and kissing and holding Paul. Right? Just think of the impact and the relationships that Paul built in that place and the passion with which he loved. We see this passion reflected in how the people feel about him. We see this poverty in spirit. Poverty in spirit meaning being open-hearted people, being humble people, being receptive people, opening our hearts to receive. And when we open our hearts to receive, right? Yes, we risk getting hurt. We risk being taken advantage of. We risk pain. But also, we become more loving people. We become people who can reflect God's grace. We become people who can serve. If you notice, when you're, tell me this, when your heart is closed or when you're being proud, how easy is it for you to serve? <laughs> no, right? When your heart is closed and when you're feeling proud, Maybe you serve because you have to, but you're complaining and griping the whole way and you're gossiping along the way. Amen. But to truly love and to give and to serve, just as Jesus did, means that we let go and open our hearts in humility and allow the Holy Spirit to move through us and use us as vessels. Allow yourself to be used <laughs> and abused. No, not abused. Amen. Poor in spirit. Just weeping and crying as they say goodbye to Paul. Let us so open our hearts and give ourselves away. Our time, our money, our hopes our energy, our resources, our gifts and our talents, just give ourselves away. Right? Give your love away. Let's pray. Uh, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, the ministry and life of Paul and the churches that were established in the early days that we can come back and look and glean something of what it means to be your body. Help us to be open people. Help us to be humble people. Help us to be alert. People who are alert and awake and are aware of the people in need and suffering around us, aware of our neighbors who you're calling us to love and serve. For it's better to give than to receive. For us, sometimes it's so hard to receive. 
Break our hearts, Lord. Break our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for joining us today. Immediately following service, we will be Zooming our Zoom coffee hour and the information is here. Come say hi. Tell us what you're doing for lunch and, uh, and then you can come and go as you please. So that information is there. Um, also, um, as a leadership, we, uh, again, I mentioned that we've been discerning and praying about reopening and some sort of limited capacity since it's been over a year since we've met in person and so we're looking at a soft reopening um, in our facility on june 20th june 20th and we're going to have a limited number of people so we'll put out uh, an, maybe an evite or a rsvp process so we can stay in compliance and remain safe We'll have protocols in place like wearing our masks um, while we're inside, um, worshiping. And so be on the lookout for more information about that and for the inv invitations to be sent out. But we're excited about this and uh, we're going to continue. If Even if uh, uh, maybe you, you want to come, but uh, you feel safer at home, no pressure to come worship in person when we reopen. Um, we're going to do a hybrid service where it's both in person, but we'll also be streaming what's going on here live so you can participate um, at home still. So please uh, receive the benediction. As we go from this place, remember that God is with you in the goings and the comings and the partings and, and the farewells. Know that. God is with you and calling you, calling us to step up and to love, to be alert. Go from this place with eyes wide open. Amen. you 
How I loved you 